Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? This is Lindsay Lerner, and you're listening to The Cost of the Status Quo. More people than ever are questioning why they do what they do and forging their own path. And on this show, I sit down with these entrepreneurs, trailblazers, creatives, and overall awesome beings to discuss the ideas, the opportunities, and the overall tips and tricks they're using so that the rest of us can do the same. This is The Cost of the Status Quo. Today, we're talking about art and life with the one and only Heather Rigney. Heather owns Orange Anchor Art School and is a maker of incredible art and author of not one, not two, but three books that make up the Marrow Trilogy. Heather's here today to talk about education, art, writing, and the importance of leading by example. Thank you for being here today. Oh, my pleasure. So let's take it all the way back to the beginning. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Barville which is in the northwest corner of Rhode Island. It's become famous by The Conjuring. So if you've seen that movie, it took place. The actual events took place right around the corner from my house. So (laughs) (laughs) spooky. I didn't know they were going on. So I was a very strange child growing up in the woods. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So starting in Barville, what, what, one, what was that like? And then how (laughs) did you get set on this trajectory of even being mildly interested in art? (laughs) <laughs> let's go back to like how we ended up in Burville. So my mother is from Dorchester, which is in Boston. If you're listening to this and you don't know where Dorchester is, so Boston, most people, and that's usually when I travel abroad, that's where I say I'm from. Oh, I'm from Boston because no one knows where Rhode Island is. So is that part of New York? No. Um, anyway, so my mother is from Boston and she met my dad. My parents are characters, which probably explains a lot about who I am. My dad met my mom. He's from Rhode Island. And for the first three months of their courtship, she thought he was a professional hockey player. So <laughs> that's so good. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So there's, yeah, my, my life is based on lies. He courted my mom. And I, I think, so my mom is, uh, was an auditor. Like she was also an artist, but she was an auditor. So most of my life was risk management and then dealing with my dad who was just risk. So <laughs> So they were like, yeah, yin and yang. So my dad was like, I want to move to the middle of nowhere and took his bride from Boston who like just rode the subway, didn't really drive much, uh, only knew sidewalks and then put her in the middle of the woods. True fact, my mom only walked the property. We had five acres. She only walked the property the day that they bought it. And I think one other time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. She loved it. So (laughs) truly. Yeah. So um, they kind of homestead a little bit like they raise we raise pigs and turkeys and chickens and pheasants and and geese. We had a geese. I hated the geese. So (laughs) yeah, they were like attacky. They only like my dad. So I had to like walk around with a stick all the time. Whenever they got loose, I had to get them and carry them back, like holding them by the neck and like like walking and then break and then walking. (laughs) Yeah, there's so many ridiculous stories in my childhood like when we brought them to slaughter and my dad just threw them in burlap bags and tied a rope around their neck and then threw the kids in the back and then like would take corners really sharp on purpose oh so that they were like tumbling we're like, ah! like my, my brother and I were using each other as human shields to stay away from the geese and the geese were like ah! <laughs> they, they wanted like nothing to do with it so that's my childhood <laughs> sure and if anyone really is interested in Burrowville that's still what you will find there <laughs> yeah a lot of a lot of nothing <laughs> A lot of bugs, a lot of, a lot of animals, a lot of woods. No, it's, it's actually really beautiful. And I was alone a lot. I mean, I do have a brother, but we have a four-year age difference. So like our lives were always like, you know, he was going into middle school. I was going to high school. So uh, he was like, you know, in camp and I wasn't or whatever. So like we didn't, after little people land, like we weren't together that much. And then it became apparent that I was pretty talented in art. So my mom started pushing me towards like taking art classes and which was great because then, and you know, my mom being from Boston also, she has four sisters and they still at the time lived in Boston. So I would get passed around in the summer, which was awesome. Yeah. I rode the subway and I could see what life was like outside of rural America. And I started taking classes at RISD. I started taking classes at Boston MFA. So get up at like five o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, take the train up and go do a figure drawing class. This is in high school. And then I did the RISD pre-college program, which was like life changing. And I loved it. So then I knew I wanted to go to art school. I ended up at Montserrat College of Art and I hated it 
such a hippie school at the time. Like they didn't have a campus. They were like, yeah, we rented some apartments. They're over there. I was going to leave. And I was like, what am I going to do? And then I was like, I'm going to do this in three years. Three years, Montserrat. And where is that? It's in Beverly, Massachusetts on the North Shore. But then I got out with a graphic design degree at age 20. And the only job I could get in Rhode Island, it was a porn company. Ooh. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. And I would be in charge of doing the layout for all the different fetish magazines. And I was like, that is amazing and tell hilarious. Me about the benefits package. <laughs> Stop it. Oh, that's so good. And they were like, okay. I mean, it was like at the time. So this was 1997. It was like $35,000 a year. And that was higher than anything I was being offered. Full dental, full medical. I'm like, great. Sign me up. I can look at stuff. <laughs> All day. Fine. Every day. It's fine. Oh, <laughs> right. I mean, like the the art director, like she walked in the room and I was like, oh my God. Like gorgeous. This gorgeous Asian woman who had this ponytail down past her butt and like this like jumpsuit that went like down like this. She was so chic and she was like, You get used to it. You know, you see one dick, you see them all. Like, so I, <laughs> I love every second of this. I was like, yes. So I was all ready to go. And then they, HR signed me up and they were like, you're 20. Maybe in a year you can come back. <laughs> Oof. Oh, that's so brutal. I was like, okay, so here's the fork in the road. <laughs> Damn. So I did not go the porn path. I instead decided to work with children. <laughs> Definitely a fork. Hopefully a fork. Life changing. A fork. <laughs> and then, so you end up at, at RISD. In I this did. Program. Yes, I did. Um, and that was an 18 month program. So it was very intense. So we didn't start in the fall. We started like before like the matriculating fall students. And is the goal of that program for all of those folks to go into teaching? Is that at a K through 12 level? Is that a higher ed? K through 12 and th that, that program. So there was the MATs and the MAEs, so the Master of Arts in Education. And those people were going more like in like museum education, that kind of thing. So, or like, you know, this, the study of, art education different than the teaching it was phenomenal like it was so phenomenal I worked my butt off I loved every minute of it I loved living on a campus I was like in the cafeteria all the time I was like do you people know how lucky you are <laughs> living on cereal and hot dogs man like this is awesome you finish up this program 18 months Post that, did you just dive into the public school system? Yes. How does one teach art? Because you mentioned previously, obviously, that there was something that people noticed in you and the work that you were creating, that there was some sort of talent there, both when you were here locally in Rhode Island, but also as you went into Boston and got all these different experiences. And so how did that translate from you being an artist to all of a sudden being able to shift that switch for other people? I think it's changing, but I think at the time, like there was different, there was a lot of those people. I hate this phrase as a teacher. Most of, you know, I think we all hate it. You know what I'm going to say? Those who can't teach, you know, like that kind of thing. And I think there were a lot of those, you know, like I'm a ceramicist and I'm going to teach art. It's like, you're a ceramic, you're a folk artist. Like that's not art in the art sense. Like, you know, like there's so many, and even since I've been teaching, like things have changed so much. I feel like Rizzi was at the cutting edge, you know, naturally because of the, who they are, of like really thinking about like cultural appropriation and cult, you know, versus cultural appreciation, which is super hot button topic in our teaching world, um, which things like if you're a ceramicist and you're just like throwing together, like here, cut this Tweety Bird out and color it in. Like that's, that was my art education growing up. I mean, that's what my art teacher did. There's a lot of cut and paste and color this in. So like for me, like that was important. Like, I, you know, when I, when I got to RISD, I remember like I was kind of like, I just, it's just part of who I am. Like asking, what, like, how do you grade this? Like, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you grade someone's artwork? You know, like, you know, as like, how do you look at something and be like, that's good and that's not, you know, like, and we're all at different skill levels and I'm definitely teaching kids that are not going to be little mini Picassos. And I feel like there were a lot of, teachers that just focused on the little mini mini thems you know so like and then all the others just you know like you're just in my 
face, like, which is like, I, I knew like, I can't do that. I cannot go to work every day and just put up with 25 kids. I can't stand and two I can't like, that's like, no. So I think like, there is like a special person that goes into teaching and a special person that goes into teaching art. I would say like on the front face, really wanting people to succeed at art, you know, like really wanting, because you know, we're all artists, like you write your name, you're drawing. So like, and I, I value that. I, I, I value everything. Like, it's funny. Like my, my husband looks at some of the, the kids work and he's like, what? And I'm like, this is so beautiful. It's like, you see the marks over here. This marks. He's like, it's a bunch of scribbles. I'm like, crying. No, it's human expression. <laughs> What's wrong with you? So I think oh, you have man. to be like that person. And also, I think I'm really good at not finishing things. So, <laughs> you know, like I love start, starting paintings and never finishing them. You know, the craft supplies that I buy tons of. I make two bracelets and I've got like hundreds. I could probably make a store, but I don't, you know, like, so I'm really good at that. And I think that's like really helps with being a teacher because that's all you do. Like I just half make projects and then. Because you don't want to fully make a, I, I don't. And that's how I always thought it was like, don't finish your model because then the kids are like, that's what I need to make. So you, you want to like half start it and be like, okay, this is the direction I want you to go in and then make it your own. So like, and I'm really good at not finishing stuff. So <laughs> there is not a shot in hell that I ever would have pursued art in any capacity or anything creative in the extent that I have, if it weren't for having you as a teacher, oh. like full, full stop. Oh, right here, right here. Post that era of teaching, I know you left the classroom for a bit. And so what was, what was the catalyst for that? I'm, I'm cyclical. Like I, every five years, like I need a refresh. So in 2005, I come up with my five year refresh need and I took a year off from Warwick. The HR person was really awesome. So I was like, I'm quitting. And she's like, no, like you're going to take a year of ab- leave of absence. I'm like, but no, I'm not coming back. She's like, but fine. So I decided I was going to be an interior designer. So I went back to Rizzi for interior design. And then I realized again why I left graphic design. It's the same thing. It's clients. Like I hate clients. I, I couldn't do it. So then I was like, I didn't have a job. Now I'm not teaching. I'm not a student. And there was like, I think like, uh, two weeks and Jeff my husband came home like we were living together at the time we weren't married yet and I found a um, a text only based video game so okay again this is like another low point of my life so it was based on the Rhode Island author not Edgar Allan Poe but like HP Lovecraft Lovecraft okay so this like this game was based on one of these like anchorhead right so then like you have to type things in, like turn on the light. And I'm like, the light is turned on. The room looks like this. I was like, oh, so great. Because I can't, I have no hand-eye coordination. So this is great, just writing, you know? So like, if I shut the computer off, I would lose my progress. So for two solid days, I had my laptop in bed with me and I only played that game and I never shut it off. I didn't shower. I didn't really eat much. I didn't leave the bedroom except to go to the bathroom. And Jeff was like, okay, this is an intervention. <laughs> I don't Shout care to Jeff. what job you get, <laughs> but find one because you're disgusting. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so we were living on the east side and I walked down Hope Street. And um, at the time, it's now a cat. It's called like Kitty Hotel or something. It's across from Tortilla Flats. It used to be a flower shop. They had a, they had a help wanted sign there. And I was a florist for the, um, yeah, I became a florist. I don't know, like eight months, eight or nine months. And then I went, and then I decided, like, then I realized, like, I loved it. Like, because like it was a big greenhouse and it was like February. So it would be snowing outside and I'm like sweeping up things and watering plants and like the oxygen. And it was beautiful. But at some point, I recognized I am getting paid minimum wage to sweep a floor and I have a master's degree. So I went back to teaching and that was great. And then I taught some more. I actually I switched schools when I went back. I, that's what I had been at Gorton. And then I came, and that's when I met you. So when I came back, and yeah, around that time. And then I had Finn, and I taught with Finn as a little person until 2000. So Finn was born in 2008, I worked until 2011. And so 
you left you left teaching again. Yep. In 2011, I left again to be with Faith. Um, our living situation changed. We had bought another house. So the house we're living in now, we had bought in 2004 as a two family. And then in 2005, we bought this monster of a house thinking we were going to fill it up with children. It was during right before the banks crashed. Um, so we were deeply in debt. Like we had two mortgages. It was hell. And I remember like, I remember coming home from work and I was like teaching camps and like, so we could pay the mortgages. Like we're trying to like be a landlord, be a homeowner, be a parent, new parent, make money. And like, I remember like my parents were watching Finn and like they came once and I was just so tired. I was just laying on the floor and my dad was like, you need to do something about your life. Like you are not in a good place. And I was like, he's right. Like he is absolutely right. Like I look horrible. I feel horrible. Nothing good is really happening. So I was like, that's it. And then, so this is like when the banks crashed and I was like, Jeff, we are not paying our mortgage. (laughs) We're done. So we short sold the house to stop paying the mortgage, paid off all my student loans. It was great. Like that's the only, I I don't recommend that people out there listening. Like, like now. Not the strategy, but it worked for you. No, I mean, it was Mm. like a sign of the times. Like that, that's what happened. Like things were not, we should never have gotten the loan that we got. Um, We way overpaid. We shouldn't have been approved. It was bad. Like, so, so we short sold the house. We moved back into this house, tenant living downstairs at the time. And it was like, oh my God, we have so much money. Like, (laughs) how do we do this years ago? I don't know. We like, we sold our car. I sold all, I sold everything. Like I was like, it was amazing. I went from 10 rooms to four. Like we didn't even have the third room. Yeah. I was like, I don't need anything. I need whatever. Like I was amazing because at one point, like we were so like, our lives are so effed. Like we were like so bad. And I remember sitting on the bed with him like not holding fan and being like, everything I need is on this bed. Like, I don't, I don't need anything else. Let's go to the other house. Like we're out of here. Like, like why, why do we have this big giant house? Like we're like, you know, and we went through infertility and it was apparent we were not having more children. So we're not going to fill the house up with children. So let's go back to the two bedroom apartment and call it a day. And she, and Finn, Finn was small at the time. So they didn't take up our space. So liquidate everything, no expenses, don't have to sweat anything, which created then presumably created the space so that you got to focus on writing because that's what Jeff was like one of us doesn't have to work one if we'll save money on daycare if one of us is home so like you know like I was with Finn you know I was a mom and then like Finn did go to preschool because they needed interaction with other kids and I was like I don't know what I'm going to do with my time and I'd always wanted to write prior to having Finn it was very early in the internet years again I think it was WordPress like early early WordPress I had like a blog and I didn't tell anyone I knew I was doing this and I was writing poetry and putting it up. And I found like this network of people from all over the country that were also like under assumed names, like posting. And some of them were like blogging about their life. And some of them were just posting poetry. And I was in like a group and we would share comments on things. And my name was Nomia actually at the time, which is the villain in one of my books. So yeah, full circle. So, and then I, you know, I have like, I don't think it was necessarily good poetry, but it helped. And then Um, And I just loved, loved writing. And like towards the end of my teaching career, I just started writing, just writing and writing, writing short stories. And I took a writing class at RISD and back to RISD. And yeah, they had a writing class. I met some really wonderful people that I are still friends with today through that class. And I ended up making a writer's group with them. And we were, I wrote a children's book. It was, uh, I still think it's it's worth something. It was was, uh, the caper it was the mysterious caper of the mysterious caper. It was a culinary field trip for children, finding out what a caper is. So these kids go to like different houses and like be like, "Do you have? A, do you know what a caper is?" And it would be like a different family from a different cultural background. They're like, "No, I don't know what that is, but we're making whatever." I forget. They're like non bread right now. Do you want to come in and learn what non bread is? And it's like, "Oh yeah." So these kids like add, on their quest to find out what a caper is, like they end up learning different things. Like nobody bought it. I sent it out. No one was interested. So anyway, I was like, okay, maybe I'd be better at writing a novel. And I was still teaching at the time. And I noticed like the boys in my class were like, not like this is where, like the, the twilight years, the twilight years, which makes it sound like, you know, I'm dying, but no, like the, it was like, you know, the twilight vampire years, um, you know, where every girl was walking around with a book, the twilight book, you know, reading these books like crazy. Also, I think Harry Potter too, at that time. 
but the boys weren't really reading. And I was like, how come you guys don't read books? Like, you know, I see the girls always carrying books. Like, why are you they're like, ah, books, Bob. Like, we're the sports page. There's nothing good. It was like, there's no boy books. Like, and I was like, what if I wrote you a boy book? And they were like, okay. I'm like, well, what do you want it to be about? And this was like the beginning of the Walking Dead type world. Like, so they were like, write a book about zombies. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm gonna talk about zombies. And what if it took place in the school? And they're like, yeah. So then like, they helped kind of like come up with the idea. And then I had like an application process for you to be in the book. Like you could, you know, like, it was like, what would you use to kill a zombie in the school? Like, <laughs> That's so good. I don't know if that was like okay to do or not. You know? <laughs> it was so fun though. I mean, I, I, I just shut, like I had a WordPress thing where I would put the chapters up and the kids like, this is like pre type pad, you know? So like the kids could read the chapters and they thought it was so great and they were in it. And yeah. So that was like my first book that I wrote was like, and I, you know, I'm looking back, it was terrible, but like I, I have it somewhere and I do need to like dust it off and clean it up. So then um, fast forward to then my, I was like, I'm going to write another novel. So I, um, those friends that I met at the Rizzy writing group, they, we were in a writing group together. One of them was like, was self-publishing on their own, but doing it well through Amazon. Romance writer, which romance writer is like, if you have like an ounce of talent, romance writing is where you're going to make the money. Like it's just, there's so much money in romance writing. So Christine, the romance writer, she was like, there's a bunch of us. She's like, I want to do a short story collaboration. Let's do mermaids. I think at the time I was painting mermaids. And like, she was like, you know, you like painting mermaids. So I read a mermaid story. So I wrote a mermaid story and it was in this compilation called Dive. And like, I wrote it and then Jeff, I read it out loud to Jeff. And he was like, that is so boring. I'm like, tell me why. He's like, is this adult? You know, and I was like, okay. Because it was like a, about a young woman who had just moved to an area. It was kind of like a metaphor for my life. Like I kind of lost my peer group when I stopped teaching. So like I'm now I'm a stay at home mom. And I, you know, all these people that I knew I interacted with at the playground, you know, and some of them in my head, like, you know, I'd be like, oh, that seems like a nice person, but I don't have this. I don't have the courage to go over and talk to her. So I wonder what her life is like, you know, like all these like little stories in my head. So she was really boring at first. And then I was like, what if like, and then uh, Suki Stackhouse from True Blood, like was happening at that time. And I was like, the great thing about Suki Stackhouse was she's a waitress, you know, like, so it was like, she's got like, you know, telepathy or whatever, but she's a waitress. So <laughs> like, I love that. So I was like, okay, what if my main character is a funeral director? And what if she's drunk all the time? <laughs> she's a functioning alcoholic. Now that's a fun story. So like, I was like, I want to hear more about that. And she's a mother. So like, how do you balance being a functioning alcoholic, a funeral director and a mother, and then run into a mermaid that's killing people? Like now we got a story. So I wrote that short story. People were like, we want more of this. Like everyone was like, you got to Like even Christine was like, you got to keep going. Like that's, I mean, come on, you've got something here. So I kept going and I just, I, I finished the book and I, I thought I finished the first book and I was like, well, I did that. And she was, Christine again, read it. And she was like, no, you gotta keep going. Make it a trilogy. Okay. And writing advice 101, don't decide to write a trilogy after you've written the first book because that's stupid. <laughs> if you've learned anything from this podcast. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's yeah. Plan it out from the beginning. I am like, I have become known amongst the writing groups that I am a pantser. So there's there's plotters and pantsers. I'm a pantser. I mean, I'd, I'd like to believe that I'm a better plotter now, but like I was the pantser at the time. Sounds sexy, but it's not. <laughs> Just chaotic. I do keep copious notes. Like I am crazy organized and things like that, but I didn't really plan out where it was going. So like I had a major meltdown during the second book. It was at Wildflower which is a vegan bakery in Providence. I was with a friend who was working on a, um, for a thesis and I was writing and I had like pictures of Polish vodniks on my screen, which is like this water creature. And then I had a video about a song about vodniks. And then I had a geo map of Croatia. And then I had like, I had like all of these screens open and like something in my brain just went like, and I just started yelling and like, I mean, I'm yelling. Like I've never done this in public before. Like, I mean, Oh my God, who do I think I am? Who do I think I am? I am not a writer. Like I, I am an art teacher who is a mom and like, I'm vibing. I don't know what I'm doing. I, it's, it's that loud. And, and 
my friend like looked at me and everyone's staring at me. She's like, I think you need to go home. I'm like, yeah, I'm going home. Yeah, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> oh my gosh. So where did you find the, the confidence to keep going? So my best friend, Iris, I called her on the way home. I was like crying. Like I just lost, lost it in a, in a coffee shop. And she was like, okay, you need to take two months off. Like maybe just a month, but maybe two. And like, it was like February. She's like, don't, don't do this. And I did. And then I, and I actually did like a one woman writer's retreat <laughs> at my parents' place on the Cape because they're like snowbirds now. So like they were not there. So like in March, I moved in there by myself. I made a deal with myself. I'm going to write 8,000 words a day. And I did. I wrote in five days. I wrote 8,000 words every day. And so through all of this, I mean, if there's anything that I'm hearing that you are good at, somehow managing all of this change, everything from identities to professions to just different hobbies and curiosities, like that's incredible to be able to manage all of those things over the years. Are there any tips or tricks or habits that you've developed that have allowed you to continue to flex that muscle? What I would say is I'm really good at being reflective and checking in. I have struggled with PMDD my whole life, which if you're not familiar with that, it's um, premenstrual dysphoria disorder, where my periods are so, my hormone swings are so severe that there have been times where I've been suicidal. And it would be like the next, as soon as I get my period, I'd be like, oh, I feel so much better. <laughs> and I'd be like, wait a minute. Like yesterday, I was really like almost going to walk into the ocean. Like, so like, what the hell? So I'm medicated now. And I've been in a lot of therapy because like it took a long time to realize like what that was, like what was causing that. So I've learned to be really, really hyper um, reflective, like checking in, like constantly checking in, like what's going on? Why do I feel this way? What's going on? Like what, what, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Recognizing like I'm not going to stay static, unhappy, you know, like, I'm like, what's going to make me happy? What can I change? Like, I have no problem blowing up my world and rebuilding it if it means I'm going to be happy. I learned that a long time ago. So doing that and having that ability to shut it all down, blow it all up, and knowing that it's going to be okay. You know, like, it's going to be okay. You know, like, I can step off that cliff. And I see you do that. I've seen you blow it all up and like, and, and recognize like I could keep going with this and be miserable or I could change it. That leads me to my next question, which would be in this latest variation of blowing it up and putting it all back together, <laughs> you've opened your own art school, which amazing. I can vouch for it. With opening Orange Anchor, obviously you get to work with kids. You also get to work with adults. Is there a main point that you hope that they take away after taking one of your classes or going through a program with you? My like motto is like making better humans through the arts. Like it's just like, I really feel that the arts empower people to look closer, to listen, you know, have an open heart, have an open mind, like recognize that there's like lots of opinions, you know, and that the truth falls somewhere in the middle, like, you know, and that the truth is what you make it too. So you know, like some people were like, oh, they're crazy. You know, they're wearing that flag and they see it and I'm glad you identified yourself and I know what I'm talking about, you know. But then again, like I know people that wear that flag and I'm like, you're a good person, you know, and which Finn, my child, is like, oh, they're horrible people. I'm like, no, just because they have those political beliefs doesn't make them a horrible person. And I really believe that like teaching arts and like learning about as many different people as possible, like expanding that, you know, it was like, like me as a little girl getting to go to Boston, you know, and having that, you know, like, and that's what I believe the arts does. Like it really like forces you to be more intuitive to yourself and be able to listen to yourself, be reflective and then produce things. And it's, I mean, who doesn't love work with glitter? I mean, come on, like, like kids come in here and they're like, I get to work with glitter, to work with paint. I'm like, yeah, I can make a mess. Yeah. And like and adults come in and they act the same way. I'm like, okay, there's something to this. Like, you know, like people just feel like there's like so much beige out there, you know, <laughs> too much beige. So before we wrap up, we do ask everyone that comes on the show these two questions. What's the worst piece of advice that you've ever gotten? And to end it on high note, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever gotten? 
cutting bangs, I think was the worst piece of advice. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I have curly hair. And like, my friend was like, pull it to your chin and then cut it. And it went Spring! like Betty page crooked in the middle of my head. So <laughs> yeah, that was horrible. And so now what's, what's the best lay it on us. Okay. So, um, my mom's advice, which always worked for me was bloom where you're planted, which was always like, you know, like I'd be like railing against this just very riled up kid and being angry that I couldn't change things, you know? And then it was like, okay, well look around you and what do you got? And what can you do to make the best of what you got? And that was always like, cause I mean, we weren't wealthy growing up. So it was always like, you know, we don't have money for toys that many toys this year. So, you know, you got this oatmeal box, what are you going to do with it? Like, <laughs> so, you know, and I think that's great. You know, and I, that's like a good metaphor for life. And then my dad's best piece of advice to me was don't let the bastards get you down. <laughs> so keep that chin up and just, you know, like there's always going to be bastards. In your life. <laughs> so. I, I have one, one distinct memory from my wild year at art school. And there was a girl in the program and she was also a photography student and we were in the dark room and she had a tattoo and all she said was, Oh, I, I have a tattoo. They were talking about a similar metaphor. And I was kind of overhearing this, this conversation and I turned around and her tattoo was just like, right, basically like right where her underwear was. So she's like unzipping her pants and she's, and I turned around to this. I was like, what the, it's like, damn, like this is what we do here. Okay. And she, she like unbuttons her pants and she puts it, puts it down. And in Latin, it said, don't let the bastards grind you down. Yes. I love that. I was like wondering where this is going, but I love that. It stuck. I was like, that's, that's it. Yeah. That is absolutely it. It's so true. I mean, it's just like, yeah, my dad always said that to me. Like, I'd be like, you know, like I'd just be unhappy. And when my dad said that, I guess that's where I get blowing it up. He's like, you know, don't let other people dictate to you your happiness. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing all your stories today. You are welcome. Thank you for listening to The Cost of the Status Quo and learning the wisdom, stories, and ideas that will have you feeling inspired and ready to take on the world. If you've enjoyed this, please remember to share, rate, and review. It means the world to me and the team putting it all together. If you're looking for more information, you can find us at costofthestatusquo.com or on Instagram at costofthestatusquo. If you've got any questions or curiosity about me, you can find me at lindsaylearner.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-L-E-R-N-E-R.com or on Instagram at lindsaylearner. Thanks again for listening. Hope you have an awesome day.